Our body continually gives us information about our state of health. Some things such as indigestion, headache, or muscle strain get our attention immediately. Our vital signs, which include temperature, pulse, respiration, blood pressure, and pain, also provide information about our well-being. Our vital signs may not always be noticeable to us, but they are measurable. For example, a steady rise in blood pressure may go unnoticed until you have your blood pressure checked. Hello, I'm Marian Karpinski, and I'll be your host during this program. Measuring vital signs requires certain skills and techniques. Accuracy is very important when reporting vital signs to the doctor or nurse. They rely on this information to evaluate and make decisions about the person's condition. Always take vital signs according to the instructions in the care plan. A care plan describes the person's health problems and physical limitations. It includes goals for each problem area. When recording vital signs, pain assessment, and weights, always use a flow sheet that shows multiple entries over several days or weeks. It is easier to keep accurate records or see patterns of change with a flow sheet. Record the date and time of day as well as the measurements. Always take flow sheets with you to the doctor's office. Another important point to remember is to always wash your hands before and after taking vital signs. Wear gloves if there is a chance of contact with another person's body fluid, such as mucus or feces, if the person has a condition that is contagious, or if there are open sores on the body. A rise in temperature is one of the first signs of a change in body function. Our body maintains a normal temperature of approximately 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, or 37 centigrade. When our body retains heat, this increase in body temperature is called a fever. Often, a fever is the first sign of an infection in the body. Eating, drinking, smoking, bathing, or exercising can change body temperature for a short period of time. Wait at least 15 minutes after any of these activities before taking a temperature. Body temperature changes at different times of the day by as much as a full degree. The lowest reading occurs between 1 a.m. and 4 a.m. and the highest between 4 and 6 p.m. For accuracy, routine temperature readings should be taken at the same time each day. Body temperature varies from one person to another. It's important to establish a baseline or normal temperature range for each person. You can do this by taking the temperature reading daily over several days. Hormonal changes can affect a woman's temperature reading. The elderly often have a lower body temperature with oral temperature readings as low as 95 degrees Fahrenheit or 35 centigrade. A thermometer is used to measure the body temperature. There are different styles of thermometers. Mercury-filled thermometers have been replaced with mercury-free thermometers that are numbered in either Fahrenheit or centigrade. Digital thermometers beep when it is time to read the temperature. Their display shows the degrees in Fahrenheit or centigrade. Disposable thermometer strips are flexible patches that are placed on the forehead. The temperature is shown by a color change on the strip. Electronic tympanic or eardrum thermometers are more expensive and are mainly used in the hospital or when taking an infant's temperature. Signs and symptoms of an elevated temperature include thirst, headache, flushed skin, irritability, sweating, chills, and unusual fatigue. The most common way to take the temperature is to place the thermometer under the tongue slanted toward the side of the mouth. Taking an oral temperature is not recommended if the person is receiving oxygen, is unconscious, restless or confused, can only breathe with the mouth open, has mouth sores, or if the person cannot hold the thermometer because of paralysis or injury to the face or mouth. Taking an oral temperature is not recommended for infants or young children. To take an oral temperature, begin by gathering the supplies. You will need a thermometer, cotton pads, a disinfectant, disposable gloves, and a watch. Always check the thermometer for breakage or cracks. Wash your hands and apply gloves before taking a temperature. Use a disinfectant saturated cotton pad to clean the thermometer. 
Start at the least dirty end, which is the stem end, and wash it to the bulb end by twisting the pad firmly along the thermometer. Wash for 30 seconds. Then let it air dry. The disinfectant will continue to work as it dries. Another way to clean the thermometer is to use plain soap and water. Wash for 30 seconds using the same twisting action to clean. Then rinse with warm water and dry with a cotton pad. Oral thermometers measure temperatures from 94 to 108 degrees Fahrenheit and 35 to 42 degrees centigrade. Long and short lines indicate measurements and there are two scales, one for Fahrenheit and one for centigrade. On the Fahrenheit scale, each long line represents one degree and each short line is two-tenths of a degree. To read centigrade, the long line is one degree and each short line is one-tenth of a degree. Before taking the temperature, explain what you are going to do and tell the person he or she will need to hold the thermometer for three minutes with the mouth closed. Shake down the thermometer to a reading of 95 degrees or below by snapping your wrist. Insert the bulb end of the thermometer under the tongue slanted toward the side of the mouth and leave in place for three minutes. After three minutes, remove the thermometer. Use a tissue or pad to clean it before reading. When reading a thermometer, hold it horizontally with the bulb end pointed to the left. Slowly turn the thermometer until you see the silvery column. Read the number at the point where the silvery column ends. When finished, clean the thermometer using a disinfectant saturated pad. Then air dry. Remove your gloves and wash your hands. Record the temperature reading. The average range for an oral temperature is 97.6 to 99.6 Fahrenheit, or 36.5 to 37.5 centigrade. Report any temperature that is not within normal range to medical personnel or your supervisor. Follow the same procedures when taking a digital thermometer reading. The digital thermometer beeps when the display is ready to read. Most digital thermometers come with probe covers that are disposed of after each use. Even if a probe cover is supplied, the thermometer should still be cleaned with a disinfectant solution. The axillary or armpit area is used when the temperature cannot be taken orally. This method is the least accurate and takes 10 minutes to complete. However, it is often the best method to use for people who are confused, have Alzheimer's disease, or related dementia. If the person has just washed or applied deodorant, wait 15 minutes before taking an axillary temperature. Dry the armpit area with a towel. Shake the thermometer down to 95 degrees or lower. Place the bulb end of the thermometer in the center of the armpit. The thermometer needs to be in contact with the skin. Bring the arm close to the body and place the forearm over the chest to hold the thermometer in place for 10 minutes. After 10 minutes, read the temperature, then clean the thermometer and wash your hands. Record the temperature by placing an A for axillary after the degree. The normal range for an axillary temperature is 96.6 to 98.6 Fahrenheit, or 36 to 37 centigrade. Report any temperature that is not within normal range to medical personnel or your supervisor. The third method for taking a temperature is rectally. It is the least preferred method because of the chance of tissue injury, contact with body fluids, and an increased risk of infection. Rectal temperatures should not be taken if the person has diarrhea, rectal disease, or rectal surgery. Always wash your hands and apply gloves before taking a rectal temperature. Then gather the supplies. You will need a rectal thermometer, lubricating jelly, a washcloth or tissues, a disinfectant pad or wipe, and a watch. Clean the thermometer with a disinfectant wipe using a firm twisting action from the stem end to the bulb end, then let it air dry. Be sure to check for breakage or cracks. Tell the person what you plan to do. Position the person on the side facing away from you with the top knee bent toward the chest. To ease insertion, Place a small amount of lubricating jelly on a tissue and lubricate one and a half inches from the bulb end toward the stem end. Raise the top buttocks to expose the anus. 
Then insert the thermometer one to one and a half inches into the rectum. For a child, insert the thermometer one inch. To prevent injury, hold the thermometer in place for three minutes. After three minutes, remove the thermometer and clean it with a tissue. Then read the temperature and remember it to record later. Clean the thermometer with a disinfectant soap pad for 30 seconds. Let it air dry before placing in the storage container. Then clean the lubricating jelly from the rectal area with a washcloth. Remove the gloves and wash your hands. Reposition the person in a comfortable position. The average range for a rectal temperature is 98.6 to 100.6 degrees Fahrenheit or 37 to 38.1 degrees centigrade. Report any temperature that is not within normal range. It is important to be consistent when taking an oral, axillary, or rectal temperature. If you start taking the temperature orally, then continue to use that method unless the person has a change in condition that requires another method. Consistency helps maintain accuracy. The pulse is a second vital sign. The pulse tells us how fast the heart is beating. Measuring the pulse gives us information about the circulatory system. As the heart beats, blood moves through the arteries. The throbbing of the blood against the artery walls creates the pulse. You can use your fingertips to feel the pulse on particular areas of the body. Exercise, pain, fear, internal or external bleeding, and fever can elevate the pulse rate. Some medications can lower or elevate the pulse. Infants have a higher pulse rate than adults. The most common site for taking the pulse is the radial artery, located on the thumb side of the wrist. Another easy place to feel the pulse is the carotid artery, located on either side of the neck. When taking the carotid pulse, use only one side of the neck to avoid constricting blood flow, which may cause dizziness. The person should be at rest for 15 minutes before taking a pulse. Always wash your hands to reduce the spread of germs. Tell the person what you plan to do. Make sure he or she is sitting or lying comfortably with the arms supported. Find the pulse by placing the tips of your first three fingers on the person's inner wrist on the thumb side. Feel for the pulse by pressing lightly. Too much pressure can stop the flow of blood, especially for older adults, and you will not feel the pulse. Never use your thumb because your thumb has a pulse of its own, making it difficult to get an accurate reading. There are two important qualities to notice about the pulse. The first is the force of the beat. Is the pulse absent? Or is it difficult to feel and feels kind of thready? A weak pulse is somewhat stronger than a thready pulse. A normal pulse is easy to feel and a bounding pulse is full and spring-like and doesn't go away under moderate pressure. The other important quality to notice is the rhythm of the pulse. Does the heart or pulse skip a beat? Or is the time between beats the same? An irregular pulse is more common in an older adult. If the beat is irregular, count the beats for one full minute. Use the second hand on your watch. Start counting at the beginning of a minute or at the half minute. If the beat is regular, you can count the beats for 30 seconds and simply double that number to get the pulse rate for the full minute. A normal adult pulse rate is 60 to 100 beats per minute. Report any pulse that is below 60 beats per minute or above 100. Record and report any irregularity of beats or any change in the force of beat. If you can't feel the pulse, or if it is irregular, use a stethoscope to listen to the heartbeat. The stethoscope has earpieces, tubing, a chest piece that includes a diaphragm and bell. The diaphragm and bell are used to hear body sounds. Use the diaphragm when listening to the heart. Place the earpieces in your ears facing forward and check to see if the diaphragm is on by tapping it gently with your fingers. You should hear a magnified tapping. If you don't, it may not be turned on for that side. All stethoscopes are not the same. This stethoscope has two tubes that go, one goes to the bell and one goes to the diaphragm, so it's not necessary to make any adjustments for either side. With this stethoscope, 
you'll notice that from the ear pieces to the chest piece, there's only one tube. So in this, in this stethoscope, it's necessary for you to turn it to either side, the bell side, or to turn it to the diaphragm side. So that's why you want to listen for that magnified tapping sound. The other thing to remember about stethoscopes is that once you have the ear pieces in, you want to be in control of the chest piece because if you bang this against the table or a chair, it can be very painful to your ears. The apical pulse measures the actual beating of the heart. Apical refers to the apex or tip of the heart. To take an apical pulse, begin with a clean stethoscope. Use a disinfectant wipe to clean the ear pieces and diaphragm. Expose the left side of the chest. Place the ear pieces of the stethoscope in your ears. Locate the apex or tip of the heart by placing the diaphragm about two inches below the left nipple and a little toward the center of the chest. Adjust the position of the diaphragm until you can hear the heartbeat clearly. Then begin to count the heartbeats for one minute. Each lubdub sound is one beat. Listen for the rhythm of the beat. Is it regular? Or is it irregular? Record the rate and rhythm. Respiration is the act of breathing. Measuring respiration is one way to monitor how the respiratory system is working. The same factors that affect the pulse may also affect respiration. Exercise increases the pulse rate and respiration because the respiratory and circulatory systems work closely together. Other factors that increase respiration include medications, smoking, age, gender, stress, and illness. Respiration should be measured when the person is at rest. Wait 15 minutes after any activity. People tend to control their breathing when they know that their breathing is being measured. If possible, observe the person's breathing without him or her noticing. The easiest way to do this is to continue counting respiration after taking the pulse. If you leave your fingers on the wrist and begin counting respiration, the person will think that you are still taking the pulse and will not try to alter his or her breath. Breathing in and breathing out counts as one respiration. Taking deep breaths or sighing is normal. Count respiration for a full minute to get an accurate picture of the respiratory rate. Normal respiration has a regular pattern. The breath is even, quiet, and effortless. When counting respirations, observe the depth of the respiration. Is the breath short and shallow or long and deep? Does the chest rise and fall on both sides evenly? Then check the rhythm of the breath. Is the in-breath about as long as the out-breath? Are there periods of no breath? Listen to the breath. Is it raspy, gurgling, or wheezy? Observe the effort it takes to breathe. Is it difficult, easy, or painful? The normal respiration rate for adults is 12 to 20 breaths per minute. Children breathe more rapidly. Older adults, especially at rest, will breathe more slowly. Report respirations below 12 per minute or above 20 per minute. Once a respiratory rate, pattern, and rhythm have been established, then any change in that pattern should be noted and reported to medical personnel. Blood pressure is the fourth vital sign. Blood pressure is the force that blood exerts against the walls of the blood vessels. This force is caused by the heart pumping blood into the arteries. When the heart contracts, that pressure is called the systolic pressure. It is always the higher number in a blood pressure reading. When the heart is resting and filling with blood, there is less pressure against the arteries. This pressure is known as diastolic. It is the lower number of a blood pressure reading. An average blood pressure reading is 120 over 80, but readings vary depending on different factors, such as race, age, gender, fitness, illness, medications, smoking, bleeding, and acute pain. Normal blood pressure range is between 100 over 70 to 140 over 90. 
Exercise can temporarily cause a rise in blood pressure. Wait 15 minutes before taking a blood pressure reading. To measure blood pressure, you need two instruments, a stethoscope and a sphygmomanometer. The sphygmomanometer is commonly known as a blood pressure cuff. It has four parts, an inflatable cuff, a valve that controls the air that goes in and out of the cuff, the bulb that is squeezed to allow air into the cuff, and a dial. Using too small or too large a cuff can give a false reading. Blood pressure cuffs are available to fit a larger or smaller arm. If you are just learning how to use blood pressure equipment, there are several activities that will help you to become more skilled. To become comfortable with the cuff, practice wrapping and unwrapping it around someone's arm. To become more skilled with pumping and releasing the air from the cuff, practice with the cuff on a used plastic soda bottle that is filled with water. One of the first things to learn is how tightly to close the valve with the same hand that you used to inflate the cuff. Notice that if you close the valve too tightly, it is difficult to open. Then practice the speed at which you release the air. If you release the air too quickly, it is difficult to read the dial. And if you release the air too slowly, the cuff pressure can be painful and may even be harmful to the person. This dial shows the appropriate speed for releasing the air, which is two to four millimeters per second. The third skill you need to practice is reading the dial. The dial shows numbers from zero to 300 millimeters. Each line represents two millimeters. For example, this dial reads 120 over 80. This dial reads 164 over 86. Listening is another skill you need to develop. When listening through the stethoscope, sometimes you'll hear sounds like the tubes touching each other, or you might hear the diaphragm hitting against the cuff. The sound of the blood pressure is an even tapping sound, so you need to learn the difference between the two. Because blood pressure varies from person to person, it's important to determine the amount of air to inflate into the cuff. For someone who has a high blood pressure, you need to inflate the cuff above the systolic reading. And for someone who has a low blood pressure, you don't want to inflate the cuff too high because it can be harmful to them, especially someone who is frail and elderly, or it can also be painful. So there are three ways you can determine the amount of air to inflate the cuff. One is to just simply ask the person, what is their blood pressure? What's, what's your normal blood pressure, Kay? Mm, about 120 over 80. Okay, so if her blood pressure is 120 over 80, then you'll want to inflate the cuff to about 150. You'll want to go about 30 millimeters higher than her average reading. You can also determine that by simply looking at the flow sheet and, and finding the average reading on the chart. Another method is to inflate the cuff to a moderate number, and a moderate number would be 140 millimeters. So you inflate the cuff to 140, and if you should start to hear the tapping sound, then you know you haven't inflated the cuff enough, and you want to inflate it another 30 millimeters higher. If you do inflate the cuff to determine the sound, it's important to take the cuff off and let the arm rest again before you take the, the blood pressure to get an accurate reading. The third and most accurate way to determine the amount of air to inflate into the cuff is to find the radial pulse. Once you find the pulse, then inflate the cuff until you no longer feel the pulse. When you no longer feel the pulse, look at the number on the dial, and then you'll need to add 30 millimeters to that number. For example, if the radial pulse could no longer be felt at 100 millimeters, then I would add 30 millimeters to that number. The amount of air to inflate the cuff would be 130 millimeters. Before you begin to take a blood pressure, eliminate any background noise such as TV, radio, fan, or heater. Always wash your hands before beginning the procedure. Gather the supplies you will need, such as the blood pressure cuff, stethoscope, disinfectant wipes, paper, and pencil. Clean the stethoscope and diaphragm with a disinfectant wipe. Okay. Explain to the to person what you are planning now. to do. Okay? The person That's should be good. sitting comfortably or comfortable? in a reclining position. Yeah. Then uncover the arm that you will be taking the blood pressure on. If the arm is injured, paralyzed, has a cast or an IV infusion, do not use it to take blood pressure. Avoid taking blood pressure on an arm that has had surgery or if a breast has been removed on that same side. 
Adjust the arm so that it is level with the heart, palm side up. Remove any air that is left in the cuff by opening the valve and squeezing the air out. Then close the valve. The pointer on the dial should be at zero. Wrap the cuff around the arm about one inch above the elbow. The arrows on the cuff should be pointing toward the brachial artery that is at the inner side of the elbow. The cuff should be secure, even, and not too tight or loose. Place the dial on the cuff or in a place where you can read it easily. Put the stethoscope earpieces in your ears. Place the diaphragm of the stethoscope on the brachial artery that is located at the inner side of the arm. Inflate the cuff to the appropriate number. Keeping your eyes on the dial, deflate the cuff slowly by turning the valve counterclockwise. Listen closely. As the dial begins to drop, the first sharp thump you hear is the systolic pressure. Note the number on the dial and remember it. Keep listening and reading the dial as the pointer continues to fall. The last thumping sound you hear is the diastolic pressure. Remember the number so you can record it later. Allow the remaining air to escape from the cuff. Remove the cuff, leaving the valve open. Then record the blood pressure reading. The systolic pressure, which is always the higher number, is recorded above the diastolic and is separated by a slash. Clean the earpieces and diaphragm with a disinfectant, then wash your hands. Report any blood pressure reading that is not within normal range or is changed from what is normal for that person. If you do get an abnormal blood pressure reading, then take the reading in the other arm as well and report the pressure for both arms to medical personnel. Sometimes when taking a blood pressure, you will hear the beat all the way down to zero. When that happens, you need to listen for a subtle change in sound. When that subtle change in sound occurs, that will be the diastolic reading. Record the pressure in this way. The systolic pressure is the higher number and is the first sound you heard. The diastolic pressure, or the lower number, is where the quality of sound changed. And zero is when the last sound was heard. Electronic blood pressure devices measure the blood pressure without the use of a stethoscope. They are especially helpful for people who wear hearing aids or are hard of hearing. A display shows the reading. Electronic blood pressure devices should be recalibrated according to the manufacturer's recommendation. To assure accuracy, check the readings you obtain from an electronic blood pressure unit with those taken at the doctor's office. Pain can affect us physically, as well as mentally, socially, and spiritually. Pain control is very important to our health and well-being. That is why pain assessment is recognized by many as the fifth vital sign. Well, I feel that it's important to assess pain because unrelieved pain can be harmful to the body um, on many levels. Physically, it can um, interfere with healing. You know, if a patient has an infection that they're trying to get over, it can slow healing. Um, it actually can make blood pressure be higher if somebody's in pain. And um, psychologically, or um, one thing that it can do is it can add to making a patient feel more anxious and depressed. Um, and then spiritually, it can be, the patient can question what they did to deserve such pain. Some people, especially the elderly, do not relate to the word pain. Rather than use the word pain, ask the person, do you hurt anywhere? Do you ache? Or are you uncomfortable? Pain scales are helpful tools for assessing pain. Explain how the scale works so that the person knows how to rate his or her pain level. The numbered scale shows that at zero there is no pain, five would be moderate pain, and ten is the worst pain possible. The face scale works in a similar way, with the smiley face meaning no pain, the slightly turned down mouth is more moderate pain, and the very sad grimacing and crying face is the worst possible pain. Older adults often relate to color, and the thermometer scale may work best for them. The lower the degree, and the color blue means no pain. The higher the degree and the redder the color means the worst possible pain. For those with vision problems, enlarge the scale for better vision. 
try to find the pain scale that works best for that person and continue to use the same one each time. It's really important to believe what the patient tells you. That's the gold standard with pain assessment, is that um, pain is whatever the patient tells you. And sometimes that's hard to believe, especially when they give you a number that's quite high and it looks like they're very comfortable. It could be that they're very comfortable because they're holding themselves very still. And when you go to bathe them and have them turn, then they um, show behaviors that they're really hurting. Also with chronic pain, Patients oftentimes can look quite um, comfortable and normal and still have a very high rating. Culture influences how we perceive pain. Admitting to pain is a sign of weakness in some cultures. Different cultures may have different beliefs about expressing their pain. Um, for example, if you're asking them if they're in pain or hurt anywhere, they may look at you and, and um, act very stoic. And so there are ways of assessing their pain even if they don't admit that they have pain. And that would be watching um, their behaviors. If they're in bed looking to see if they're grimacing or groaning or um, holding themselves very still. For some patients, they look like they're fine and perfectly comfortable until you need to go ahead and turn them. And then that's a, a key time of watching to see if they're uncomfortable. Your observation is key in determining whether someone is in pain or not. Observe the person during movement as well as when sleeping. People who hide their pain when awake may grimace or moan during sleep. It's important to observe for at least three to five minutes. People with Alzheimer's or related dementia or those with speech disorders may not be able to tell you when they are in pain. Common signs of pain include a furrowed brow, tightened lips or clenched teeth, flushed or pale face, a frightened look, tense or rigid body, bracing, clutching or holding on to things, restlessness, fidgeting, or rubbing the affected area. The person may groan, gasp, whimper, or sigh when you try to move him or her. The person may scream or curse or say, stop it, quit that. Pain can also affect a person's vital signs. Record the pain scale rating on a flow sheet so that any patterns of pain can be identified more easily. Record your observations, including behaviors and physical signs of pain. Report any significant changes in comfort level to the doctor, nurse, or your supervisor. Any sudden pain or a rapid increase in pain should be reported immediately. Even though weight is not one of the vital signs, weight can provide valuable information for the doctor or nurse. Many medication dosages are based on weight, and a significant weight change, whether gain or loss, can cause medications to be less effective. Rapid or even gradual weight loss or gain can be associated with illness. For example, the first symptom of cancer is often weight loss. Signs that may indicate weight loss or gain are a change in appetite or the fit of clothes and rings. Puffiness in the legs and ankles or dimpling of the skin may be a sign of weight gain. Always weigh the person at the same time of day, on the same scale and with the same or similar clothing in order to get an accurate measurement. Record weight on a flow sheet and report any patterns of weight loss or gain. Always take vital signs when you observe a change in the person's condition such as a change in appetite, energy levels, behavior, or elimination. All the vital signs should be taken at the same time, because a change in one will usually affect the others. Vital signs are an important part of healthcare and should be taken seriously. It takes time and practice to learn the procedures correctly. And with practice, you will become efficient, accurate, and confident.